Now, the floor is to Sabina Alkaya from Oxford. Sabina is, are you connected? Sabina, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Yes, thank you. Good afternoon. Good evening. <laughs> yes. No, thank you so much. And I've, I've learned a lot from the previous speakers. And uh, I, I'm very grateful for this gathering. And I think that it's a, a wonderful place and time to exchange work. And I think the hope of this group is that economics, in, in terms of one of the contributors to the discussion, is poised to change. And that fault lines um, under the COVID crisis are um, opening space for a kind of a creative rebuilding. And so I'd like mainly to um, divert from what I usually work on, which is poverty and poverty measurement. Um, but I would mention, just following up from Maximo's fantastic overview, uh, a couple couple things there, and then, then move to really addressing the question that was um, put to us. Um, so since March, our research group has been obviously alongside governments, so states, who are doing the COVID response. Um, and whether it's Colombia, Honduras, Iraq, Pakistan, Afghanistan, Angola, Maldives, just lots of countries and trying to be able to simulate improbable impacts of COVID, trying to use either remote data or uh, reanalyze existing data to try to inform some of the poverty responses. And that's been quite interesting in also seeing how states are having to have space for creativity um, because of all of the, the terrible pressures and, and difficulties that they're under. Um, and the second point um, is that we also estimate with UNDP a multidimensional poverty index um, this year covering up 5.9 billion people, 107 countries. So we did some elementary predictions of um, the impacts of the World Food Programme's estimations at the time and the UNESCO estimations. And exactly as, as others have said, found that in terms of a global measure of poverty, multidimensional poverty, covering 1.3 billion people, uh, the trends are set back from 3.1 to 9.9 years. So it's just to say that a lot of our work has been on, on poverty and it's it, the impacts of COVID. And I really um, join the voice with others in terms of, of the importance of having a short-term response as, as well as thinking about the longer-term things. But I'm also joining from Bhutan, um, where I got stuck uh, at the moment. And, and it's interesting because they have obviously a gross national happiness measure, which is a, a single national index that goes from um, income, health, education, governance, environment, time use to community and culture and psychological well-being, which is positive, negative affect and spirituality. And that's in its national plan. You go to government offices and you see their flowcharts with all the dimensions. So it's an interesting context from which, you know, to try to think about um, some of these questions. It's also difficult, even in a country that's trying very consciously to find new ways of advancing non-traditional aspects of, of integral human development because the models, the paths um, uh, are not very clear, um, uh, whether it's to other sentient beings, as it were, as they call them here, or whether it's to the cultural and the psychological aspects. Um, so the question of how COVID has opened space for markets and states and integral human development to come together is interesting. Um, and for me, there's sort of two or three um, possibilities that may be differently configured now than they were before. And one is that this need, as Joe, as others have said, of con economics and economists connecting theoretical tools to a wider understanding of well-being um, is, is there. And it's, it's a question of the profession. And so you think back, you know, 10 years ago to when Nick Stern was talking in the European Economic Association, and he said, if you look at the giants of our profession, many were capable of talking and thinking about different parts of the economy in a striking way, but that economics had become very, you know, focused, each person within their subfield, each person within their discipline. 
and that the need now is really to be able to think across subfields of economics and then also into integral human development. Um, and I think that clearly the COVID response is bringing up many other dimensions of, of well being in people's practical experience, as I've said. And so in the common discourse, health or food security or family relationships or mental health or mindfulness or physical exercise have come up as, as common currency. And so it may be that that external pressure will also independently be uh, encouraging economists to, to cast their eyes to a wider horizon. Um, and uh, one of the difficulties, I think, is also that the connections between the more technical tools, mathematical tools, models, and a welfare objective has not been very popular in economics. And so Attorney Atkinson's um, article on the strange disappearance of welfare economics and some of his, his work after that had pointed out that often we cannot articulate how the policies that even are proposed will help people to flourish. Um, and those kinds of questions that have not been very popular um, might, uh, might be um, part, of, part of the work now. As, as Tim Besley you know, had put earlier, you know, economists often lost sight of the bigger picture. And so I think the question of this group and the question of, of the response is, is bringing some of these bigger questions in, not in an academic sense, but in a, a contextual sense. Um, and so what Cardinal Turkson said at the beginning of Amartya Sen's suggestion that growth is a means to an end um, is, is, the, is the question here of how different people in very specific subfields of economics, whether it's institutions, macro, micro, stability, behavioral, whatever, um, will be able to start to make some of those linkages quite um, concretely but also how they can coordinate. And so I think that the, the, the second question is about coordination. And because I work on measurement, naturally the first thing that for me seems a low hanging fruit is measurement. And others have mentioned the need to go beyond GDP and the need uh, to, to measure other, other objectives, Jeff and the World Happiness Report and that community has looked at a lot of these issues as well. And I think, you know, the Stiglitz and Fatusi Commission opened that question, synergized with the current work beyond GDP in Europe, but also has opened a lot of very significant work on wider measures of well being, whether it's the OECD two volumes, whether it's the Mark Fleur Bay Princeton group with 260 academics working on the International Panel of Social Progress. But there's been a lot of work to try to develop better measures of non-traditional aspects of human life. Um, but it seems that there are two um, quite big constraints on the use of those that, that body of work. And the first is that the dashboards are becoming larger and larger, um, but there's no synthetic measure like the GDP, which can be used, can be analyzed, can be uh, examined from different angles, uh, can be disaggregated nationally and subnationally. In, in some cases. Um, and so, and the measures that do exist are popular, like a social progress index or legatum prosperity or global peace index or human development index, but they're composite measures and they're very difficult to work with. And so I think that there would be a space um, for thinking about um, measures only that those help to coordinate and sort of crystallize the conversation a little bit but going beyond the mega dashboards that were maybe the, the first or second generation of work on well-being um, to try to uh, deliberately take some of the trade-off decisions um, about how different elements weigh against each other. And that was important in the Stiglitz and Fatusi when they said large eclectic dashboards um, just dodge those decisions, but an institution, the state has to set priorities and, and a, a measure that reflects those priorities um, can be supportive. And I wouldn't say the Bhutan at all is a, a perfect example, but it is an interesting example um, because it does have 
that as a coordinating tool in the government documents and across the institutions and 10 ministries. Um, but I think that the other big gap in terms of economics is just this gap between a multidimensional measure of well-being and, and the policies that we use. So that without going into lots of detail, and yes, there have been, and we could name them the MAMS model way, way in the MDG's time of the World Bank or the um, SIA model, which is used also quite a bit in Italy. There are a number of models that have tried to do the multidimensional um, predictions, but they're still quite weak. And one of the reasons that they're weak, and again, Tony Atkinson talked about this in the um, 2003 article on multidimensional poverty, is that there's been a, a divergence between what he called counting-based or policy measures, which either are multidimensional or look at different dimensions, and the literature on welfare economics, which didn't engage. And one reason it didn't engage is that they could not figure out human freedom. And that to me could be a central question for this group. So to be very concrete, um, what do you do about preferences? So if you would like to combine a model that advances a sustainable integral human development approach, then how do you bring in revealed preferences? So we know that preferences are not fixed and consistent. We know that they change a lot has evolved in that and yet bringing, um, bringing these worlds together the measurements and the and the models is is something that's that's quite perhaps uh, difficult. Uh, and similarly, if if we are now with the behavioral economics working out how to create instruction incentive structures so that people will be nudged or so that they will move in predicted directions that we think are positive, then how is that not paternalistic? And where is there the right role of freedom and and dissent in in those? Um, and that I think would be an interesting question for this group as well. Um, and then another is obviously to, I, I think I think it's obvious that a lot of the models are evolving with the machine learning and with the, the, the high-end computing, but engineers are really quite far ahead of economists. And so it's an exciting time because we are learning uh, about you know, how to use models that span scales, nation, state, institution, person, medical or environmental. Um, when key parameters are not understood, we can't extract trends in a simple way from the data. And there's lots of uncertainty and error bars. And yet that has been um, very common in, in the higher end engineering uh, work for a while. And so I think that that will be a, an active interface for learning, but the conversations insofar as I'm aware at that more technical level, do not intersect with the conversations on integral human development and the well being. And so it seems that there is a lot in flux um, within economics and in some of the interfaces that directly and obviously would connect with um, the interests of this group. Um, but maybe the linkages are not made. And so just, you know, to try to bring things a little bit towards action points or thinking of what might be a way forward, that a binding constraint is a lack of coordination among different groups. And if you think of the International Panel on Climate Change or um, other groups, including Mark Flerbe's group that's been set up and that looked at well-being, the challenge is, is to have coordination um, across the different groups. And one of the interesting things about the topics that we're talking about here is that it's not just well-being or a measurement topic, but it's the markets and the states and the civil society and the faith groups. And um, so it's, as Joe said at the beginning, it's uh, a more action-oriented set of agreements. Where you, um, so the question would be, can there be a coordination um, between academic work on these different topics, but with a very conscious dialogue, but also a coordination? Um, with others that are working in um, integral human development and environmental work um, and in institutional um, instantiations of that. So I think that a few different um, suggestions, and I think that the, the hope would be that if there's a clear objective, like a Verbaki group or like an open source technology, if it's really clear, then people in different parts can try to solve the problem. Um, but without that kind of a coordination and without 
um, bringing together more philosophical groups with more mathematical groups and then more institutional groups, we're not going to have all of the pieces in place. Thank and you. so this seems to be a, a wonderful forum that and the people that you're bringing together are the, are the people that um, would create that kind of a synergy. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you to you, Sabina. Thank you. In particular, you appeal to coordination. But you know, to coordinate among people belong to different groups, we have to share the telos. Telos means the ultimate purpose. And that is perhaps what is lacking today. But now